Sarah, good morning. How are you? Good afternoon to you. Yes, it's afternoon over here. Hi, Russ. You missed your cue on your countdown. I, I know I did. I was still talking through it. I shouldn't have done that. Um, that's why they that's why they give you a countdown so you don't do that. So I would be a horrible DJ. Um, Sarah, we are celebrating something today, aren't we? Is it our hundredth episode, Russ? Yes, and season four. Like we're kicking it off. <laughs> oh, this and is, season four, double whammy. Yeah, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. We made it. This is like a milestone that most podcasters usually quit after. I read like most podcasters usually quit after like ten episodes. Uh, we pushed through. We made it. We, we made it. We, we, we ten next typical. We did. So what is what's happening? This the, I know. I. I I know you have me on a journey. Uh, we're, we're going on a different journey this this season. So, what are we doing, in, you know, to, to kick things off? Well, yes, we're going to be doing our aging backwards from a hundred, uh, because of course we have a cumulative, but we have a joint age of a hundred years now, which is quite incredible. Uh, so, really, I think it's time. You know, we've kind of we're up there on the crest. I think now we start going back down the other way. We we uh, we want to start aging backwards. But we want to know how to do it the right way. And obviously, there's things we can do and, and how to prioritize that. So I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Stillman onto the show, uh, because Dr. Stillman, I'm sure, has a slightly different take on uh, the things we need to do and the things we need to measure. Uh, not just your usual, OK, this is New Year, new resolution, get down the gym and start to eat more salad, which is, you know, kind of the recommendation that I feel like I've had for the last 50 years. So I'm up for some new advice. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Dr. Stillman. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great. I've been watching your things on the quantum biology because we've had on Meredith and we've had on uh, Carrie B. Wellness. So it's great to kind of be supporting the quantum biology collective too. That's something we're totally into on the show. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Dr. Stillman, it's good to have you on because you, 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 I'm going to say something here and please don't get offended. If you do, you can just tell me you're offended. You're, you look like a vampire. You're how are you? Are you 120 years old, but yet you look <laughs> like you're still youthful. You have perfect skin. Um, what is it? It's amazing. Have you, you've, you've unlocked something about biohacking so you can stay and look so fit and young. You know, I wish I could, I wish I could, I wish I could say that it was just, I have the secret sauce. Obviously it works for what I'm doing that I look this young, but I really just have good genes. I mean, it's not just that I have good genes. I am very careful and have things really dialed in and we'll talk about how I know that because it's not just subjective. Um, I have a lot of different markers that we use in my practice for this, but you know, my dad, 83 years old, he's still going, working 10, 12 hours a day, totally obsessed with what he does. And uh, I got those genes. So it, it set me up for success. And then the rest of it is just dialing it in. It, it, my dad's 75 and will not stop working until they peel him off the floor. He is like, will not quit. I But I, I guess start there. Is it how important are your genes when when talking about longevity and, and, and living a long, healthy life? It's a small, small, small proportion of what really determines your longevity. And this is not the same as how you look, right? So people get this idea that a youthful appearance is a, is a youthful body, and that's just not true. You know, the number one reason that people appear to age, at least in my opinion, is their exposure to UV light. So UVA in particular causes photo aging of the skin. It's very intense. It's very strong uh, in terms of its effects on, on the skin. And we can see this, you know, in the skin very readily. But the thing is that despite its effect on the aging of the skin, the sun reduces all cause mortality, which means that the more sun you get, the lower your risk of death. And that means that, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I've seen hospital practice over the years who have great looking skin, but they're dying of a solid organ tumor, cancer, or, 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 lymph, or lymphatic, or immune system cancer, blood cancer, or they're dying of heart disease or whatever, right? Their skin looks good because they didn't get any sunlight, but that doesn't mean that they're healthy. 
And so this idea of appearances, you know, they're so deceiving and we have to look deeper than that, which is of course where lab work, um, uh, metrics like HRV, vital signs all come into play. And that's really what anti-aging medicine is about. It always starts there. I, th I feel like you, you know, Sarah's background because I watched Sarah's reaction when you said light and she was like, uh, she like lit up. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, of course. it's such an interesting, it's number one. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. It is. And like, it's just such an interesting point that you said there, Dr. Stillman. I think number one, we, we were taught as children. And I think I just heard this on a show I watched yesterday, but we were taught as kids that eating healthy and exercise was about appearance, was about not looking and being fat or overweight rather than being healthy. And like it actually being something that we have to do there as well. I feel like we have to start putting the sun in there because the sun needs a new PR rep because the sun is getting really beat up by melanoma. It's getting really beat up by uh, the marketing of sun sunscreen. It, it sucks. It's crazy. And it's one of the sad realities of medicine that you know there are very perverse incentives that drive most medical care. When you really get down to the job of being a great doctor, the job is to eliminate your revenue source. It is to make your patients so healthy that they don't need to come back to you. And so when you realize this, you think, oh my gosh, this is going to be really challenging. I have to get at least somewhat savvy with the social media and whatever in order to keep people coming to see me. And sure enough, you know, I just emailed a, a patient uh, the other day and he emailed me back this morning. He's like, yeah, everything's good. You know, we can't really get the lab testing where we're at right now because of, you know, they're, they're not in a country where it's what I do is very accessible, but um, you know, he has no acute medical needs for me, which is great. Very reassuring. I love getting Christmas cards from patients who, who are not, you know, under my care anymore, but it's also a really tough, it's a tough business model. And that means that a lot of doctors, they get into this mindset of, oh, we're going to do this or that or the other procedure. That's an endless stream of revenue. And then they don't think or worry about how do we keep our patients healthy and how do we prevent disease? Yeah. I was going to say, you know, the barefoot doctors in China where they get paid to keep people well, you know, you only get paid if the person stays well is probably a better model. But even that model that you're talking about, I mean, I'm over here in the UK and we have the National Health Service, of course. And so the doctors get paid regardless, but we still don't have that model of kind of keeping people fit and healthy still the model is very much you go to the doctor they look up your symptom and find the drug that matches the symptom well but the thing about the nhs and socialized medicine in general is that you still have perverse incentives because while the doctor's not getting paid based upon the number of procedures they may do or uh, patients they may see or whatever so you think they're going to deliver high quality but the people who are providing the services or the products like the pharmaceutical industry have an incentive to make sure that the NHS does what they want them to do. And so they just, you know, I mean, politicians are for sale. That's a tale as old as time. And that, I mean, I watch this happening in the United States, right? I mean, like last two years, look, they paid for all the doses of the vaccine. They weren't paying for all the cheap drugs that are safe and effective. I don't know if we want to get into this. You can stop. <laughs> we can it. stop this, but it's good. But yeah, we'll, we'll go for a little bit more. But yeah, you know how we know how we know how this goes. Yeah, I do know how this goes, and I'm honestly tired. Yeah, because there's it's just like two years of nonstop politicization of medicine, and I am yeah. tired. But the reality is that you've got to be aware of these perverse incentives, you know. And if you're not, you're gonna you're gonna wind up really missing things in your care that lead to a worse quality of life and a shortened lifespan. It, there's something about trust, right? Where trust has been broken now, where you used to go to your doctor and your doctor would tell you this uh, because of the politicization of, of all of this, you now don't trust your doctor, but should you have trusted your doctor all along? Like, so that's the question everyone's like confused about. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm a cancer survivor. And if I didn't listen to my doctor, I would not be here. I went through chemotherapy and radiation. I went through exactly what they told me to do. And I lived and I survived lymphoma. And so, but I, so I trust my doctor, my dermatologist, on the other hand, I'm not sure I trust my dermatologist yet because every time I go, they cut me up and there's just, there, there's something about, um, and we can get to the topic here of like, 
what, how do we approach and how do people approach what's the right thing to do for yourself? Because I'm on Instagram, I get pummeled with all the influencers. I have my doctor. So how do we break through that and say, the Rebel Scientist podcast is your trusted source? i kidding, but <laughs> not kidding, right? Like, what is the trusted source that we have to go to here? Yeah, um, I think it was, I want to say it was Einstein who said, by practice alone, you can become an expert. Or maybe he said the only source of knowledge is experience. And then Osler, who was the doctor who founded Johns Hopkins, said, by practice alone, you can become an expert. And so I really do believe in that that aspect of practice. And many of my friends and colleagues will say, Leland, you're going to burn out seeing patients. You've got to stop. You've got to stop taking on people. And I say, no, listen, I'm just limiting the number of people I work with because what I do is so intensive. And then I have a very small number of people who I've gotten to that place where, just like you said about Sarah, about the barefoot doctors, I get paid to keep them well. They're too busy being well to call me unless they really need me. But that's a very delicate dance because what you'll find is that the people who tend to be busy being well are also busy driving their physical body so hard, so to speak, that they wind up creating health crises that you then have to respond to. So it's tricky. And that's why I have to kind of get to know somebody before we get into that kind of arrangement. Um, other, because in, especially in our modern world, I mean, people will just run themselves ragged and then come to me sort of like, sort of a little bit like they let the house fire get out of control before calling the fire department. I say, could you have picked up the phone, you know, 10 days, 10 months, a little bit earlier. And that's where the laboratory panels for me and the continuity of my practice and my care become important because they give me data that patients often don't readily share. I'll look at something and I'll say, are you over exercising? Are you under eating? Are you, you know, doing this or that and the other thing with your dietary patterns as far as too much of this food group or too much of that food group, too much of this nutrient, too much of that nutrient. And it helps them get perspective on, oh, wait a minute, I'm working too hard. I'm taking on too much. I suffer from the same thing as a clinician. You know, my last testosterone level was not what I would describe as optimal. And it's because I've been, I was working too hard at the time. And so I took a big project that I'd taken on and I told the people who'd asked me to engage my services, look, not doing this anymore. Let me know if at some point we're able to renegotiate this because I would have to basically take on fewer patients or do less of, of what else I'm doing in order to support this. So, and I have to do that with, with people who are coming to me, you know, executives, um, high achievers, busy moms, and just say, look, I get that you want to do all this stuff, but what you're doing is, is running you ragged. And obviously I can support you with supplements and we can use things like hormones. We can even use medications, pharmaceutical drugs, but you fundamentally need to chill out, take some time for you, not put so much on your plate and engage in, you know, critical healthy habits, red and infrared light, UVB light for vitamin D, sun exposure, exercise, movement, rest, quiet. All these things are are fundamentally, I look at them very much as nutrients, not in the sense that you ingest them, but you do, you need them, right? And people who are missing them get sick and they come to me on these long lists of supplements and they wonder why they're not well. And that's why. That's so interesting because you're right. And in fact, I think I'm kind of guilty of that too, because I do do a lot of the things that you list, but I do it in order that I can focus more. I want to you know, like I do red light therapy a lot and I have a lot for the brain, but my motivation is, okay, right. if I can get my brain to a higher level, then maybe I can get more I done. Know. Or, you know, even like with the fit, with my physical fitness, you know, I'm trying to increase my physical fitness yeah. so that I can go further. Right. You know, that's kind of where, where my head's at. And that's kind of where the biohackers are going, you know, to try and be this, you know, superhuman peak performance. I get it. I'm also a success addict. But it's not even that. You just want to do, you want to be able to function better. Well, this there's something about this because when I met Sarah, I wasn't doing anything around this taking care of myself part. And I am obsessed with my supplements. I have become so obsessed with sleep that it's become a marriage discussion around why do you sleep in a separate room? I'm like, 
because you move around a lot and I need to sleep in a dark cave. Um, she understands that it's all for the show, but it's not really like I am obsessed with sleep now. Like I used to sleep four hours a night. I'm sleeping seven to eight and I feel amazing. I'm out in the sun in the morning, still can't keep the phone out of my hand uh, in early mornings. It's still an addiction, but there's something about this continuation of it. And so continuation and continuation and like it, a, it can get expensive, but B it's obsessive. And, and you know, if you miss a day and I've, I've been a workout addict. My daughter is a workout addict. And I know the, if I miss a day, oh my God, what am, you know, what am I going to do? But there's a balance here of mental health, right? So like there is a balance of, of, of knowing that um, it's mind, body, uh, and, and soul, all of those things combined together that are going to keep you healthy. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that around like, what do we do when we have this obsessive compulsion with staying healthy or how do we measure it i think that's an interesting thing for us because we want to set out on this journey where we get ourselves to a better place at the end but how do we actually track that what are the metrics we need to be focusing on this is why i created the program that i'm 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 offering now called optimal male vitality um which is optimalmalevitality.com and there's a webinar people can watch to learn more about this I'm going to roll out optimal female vitality when I have some more time to work on it. But it came out of this desire to really help high level people, driven, successful people, uh, achieve this level of excellence that they desire. And the suite of labs that I created for this program that's included in the program is what I call a conference of wellness panel, um, which is a laundry list of markers the uh, Nutrial Plasma from Genova Diagnostics, and then I do a hair tissue mineral analysis because we'll find a lot of stuff in these labs that are holding people back. Uh, I picked these after you know a long time in a lot of cases uh, looking at these numbers. And the ones that I'm most passionate about, that I, I most rely on for results are the, and this is in no particular order, Vitamin D, I don't even know if we need to talk about that. It's just everyone talks about vitamin D ad nauseum. We want that at least solidly in the middle of the range. There's a lot of controversy over whether or not you want a higher range or whatever. I won't get into that here because it's a long discussion of itself. Ferritin, the higher your iron levels and iron accumulation, uh, frequently the more sick you're going to get. And ferritin is not a great marker for total body iron. In fact, I write more about this in my book. Uh, dying to be free, but it's a really important marker because when it gets out of control, I mean, people just fall apart. I just had uh, the uh, a patient I alluded to earlier. You know, one of the key things we did for him is we got him to go donate blood and he did a ton of stuff before he met me that didn't work to fix his hemoglobin A1C and his glucose metabolism, but donating blood really helped him turn the corner. And we just had another man in the optimal male vitality program. He had a very high blood pressure. It wasn't, you know, a hospitalizable pressure, but it was definitely treatable with drugs. It's the kind of thing that a doc would really put somebody on a lot of medications for. Supplements didn't work. This and that didn't work. But a combination of sauna, breath work, and blood donation. And that blood pressure dropped 30 points in a week. So the ferritin's a key component of that because the more iron you accumulate, the higher your blood pressure is going to tend to run. So I like to look at the ferritin level. The ferritin is a reflection in many respects of your sex steroid hormone. So when you see low sex steroid hormone levels, the ferritin, the iron is going to get out of control. And that's something that not a lot of people realize. And it's why I'll do a full suite testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, as well as DHEA for the adrenal hormones and cortisol in this panel, because you want to see where their HPA axis is. You'll have people who come in who say, I feel fine. I'm doing well. I'm succeeding at work, whatever but their cortisol levels in the tank. And you say, look, you know, you're saying you feel well, but your cortisol level is low, your DHEA is low. Are you really taking time for you? And they'll, and they'll say, well, you know, actually I do have a lot going on. I am under a lot of stress. And it's, it's not a slam dunk as far as, oh, you have a low cortisol level, we have to give you more cortisol. It's more of a wake up call. You need to think about how much stress you're putting yourself under and stop accepting more and more and more jobs, opportunities, responsibilities, whatever. I mean, real success monsters will, will um, 
they'll they'll turn their what should be their regeneration and their rest into more activity exercise and stress instead of taking a vacation to a hot springs and relaxing they'll take a vacation to a surfing destination and they'll beat themselves up on the reef you know and it's it's funny because they need to hear that otherwise they run into you know really big medical problems and instead of them looking at a elevated ferritin or a high hemoglobin a1c they're in the icu uh recovering from a heart attack or in the icu with pneumonia so i look at the hormone levels as an overall measure of nutrition an overall measure of aging an overall measure of um, rest and relaxation i'll look at a lipid panel because that tells us a lot about metabolism i'm particularly concerned with the triglyceride levels there i'm not as concerned about the hdal and the ldl which people get all bent out of shape over i'll look at a comprehensive um, metabolic panel and a cbc compre- a complete blood count and what i'm looking for there is normal red blood cell size normal blood cell numbers uh and not any and i, I want to make sure there's no big abnormalities in white cell lineages like high eosinophil levels or high basophil levels or whatever, because those can all be harbingers of, of problems that people develop. In the conference and metabolic panel, we want to look for normal liver function. We want to look for normal kidney function, electrolyte levels. There's a lot of nuance to those. And there's a reason why a lot of doctors are not doing them routinely now. Uh, and I'll tell you that without you know enough time to really talk to the patient about them, I think that they're in some cases more a waste of money than an asset. Um, and there's a lot of other labs that I'll use to correlate them, uh, things that things like uric acid uh, or the ferritin level um, that can give us more insight into how to interpret those and what to do about them. And then the the Nutrivalve Plasma is a nutritional lab test um, that I, I you know I met, I found through a mentor of mine, Dr. Beck. Uh, then Joe Mercola and I, I talked about it. And we both agreed this summer that it's the best single, most comprehensive nutritional panel out there. And I looked, you know, I looked for doctor's data. I looked for Great Plains Labs, certainly looked through LabCorp Quest. This is the single best, you know, comprehensive nutritional lab test for patients. And that's why I love it. And that's why it's become one of the most popular tests, I would say, out there. Okay. And is it something that you have to do through your doctor? These aren't tests that you can kind of do from these companies? Well, pretty much any lab test you can Google and you can order directly. What patients need to realize is the markup on that can be obscene. So for example, the Nutrivalve Plasma, um, the suggested retail price is like $2,000. And it doesn't cost that. I don't think Genova wants me to tell you what the real price is. I think that would be a violation of my agreement with them. Um, but let me just tell you, it's not, it's not $2,000. And the reason for that is simple. One of the things that health insurers have done is they've allowed the labs to price gouge them because they're the only game in town. They have effectively no real competition. It's amazing to me that the public doesn't realize that the reason health insurance is expensive is there's no competition in the market. And you can buy auto insurance from 25 different people. You can buy life insurance from dozens of different providers, but you have one or two health insurance, you know, companies in in a given area. I mean, there were people, there were parts of America where there was like no health insurance available because of how restrictive the laws and legislation was. I mean, this isn't a functional market. So anyway, one of the things they've allowed is they've allowed the labs to price gouge them. And then they'll say to the patient, look, we paid for $2,000 worth of lab testing for you. What would you have done if you didn't have us? It's almost like a abusive husband or spouse. What would you have done if you hadn't had me? It's like, you know, like that doesn't uh, justify what you're doing. So we're calling, are we, are we calling uh, the healthcare providers, uh, our, our health insurance providers, uh, narcissists? Are they narcissistic? Is that what it is? That would be a control. I think they're run by some pretty, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of narcissistic. Yeah, for sure. There. A lot of cluster B personalities in the, <laughs> in the C-suite uh, meetings of the, of the healthcare industry. Um, so yeah, they're, they're way more affordable. Um, and same thing with that wellness panel. So I constantly have people coming to me. They're like, I ordered this test. I ordered that test or whatever. I'm like, stop, stop doing this yourself. Like I'll, I'll take care of your lab testing. You pay me for it. 
will take great care of you and you won't waste hundreds of thousands of or thousands of dollars on your lab tests. So anyway, um, the Nutrivel is great though. And the reason it's great is it gives you the organic acids. So you can infer a lot about your overall metabolism and your mitochondrial health from that. Uh, you're going to see your, a lot of antioxidant numbers like glutathione and whole blood. You're going to look at things like CoQ10. You're going to look at things like, um, creatinine levels and 8-hydroxyduguanine levels. You're going to look at things like plasma amino acids, uh, RBC fatty acid membrane composition, and then um, minerals in a toxic element panel. I love the minerals in the toxic element panel. I'll tell you that the toxic element panel doesn't test as many toxic elements as I want, which is one reason why I do the hair tissue mineral analysis. Things like aluminum don't come through in the, in the Genova test and they do on the hair tissue mineral analysis test. And I started to run this after I had a case where I had a very puzzling, very confusing, difficult case. We did a HTMA and lo and behold, this person had high, high levels of, I think it was chromium and strontium. And we had, we have, we still don't really know where these were coming from. And they were using a very common filter that's People love it in the health and wellness space. I'm not going to name names because I, I don't want to create any trouble or drama for myself. But, but we, I, I think it was coming in from the water. It's the only explanation I could come up with. And so you'll catch things with this suite of tests that wake people up to problems that they have. And then you can really dial in their diet, their lifestyle, their exercise. And I, I will mention the Aura Ring, which is absolutely my favorite uh, fitness tracker. And this is where I got into training people with my strength and conditioning coach, Jim Laird, uh, about six months ago. And he uses the aura ring way more than I do because as a coach, he can't order labs. And as a coach, he's usually checking in and training people on a daily or multiple times a week basis. So he, he wants more data in a, my, in my labs. I might tell someone, okay, do this for three months, but he can't do that as a coach. He doesn't you know show up and say, okay, do five reps at this number this many times a week for this many months and then check back in like January. So um, he uses the aura ring data and he interprets it very, very carefully, closely looks at, at people's um, daily routines. And I then started using this more in my practice. And what you'll see the HRV data, the sleep scores, all that other stuff respond to interventions you make based on the labs, things like blood donation, things like float tanks, things like supplementation with um, magnesium, B vitamins. I mean, just the other week I had somebody who had a low mag level. I said, take mag. You know, he texts me the next morning. He says, my HRV jumped 10, 15 points after that dose of magnesium he told me to take last night. I think that's where that's where we're going to be at because we're kind of you know we don't have access to doctors while we're kind of doing this but we I mean we're totally open to getting lab tests at the start maybe and at the end but for like monitoring as we go along we are looking at things like we've both got an aura ring you know so it's good to hear that you think that is a good indication because obviously we are going to be tracking things like HRV it's good now that you can also track your uh, oxygen saturation at night, you know, because we're doing the breathing exercise. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it's so helpful having that data. I mean, you have almost as much data in the aura ring as I have in an ICU. That's unbelievable. When you think about it, it's just this tiny little piece of, I don't even know what this is made of. Um, and that, that and the level of information is at my fingertips. That makes, and this is why, one of the reasons why as a virtual doc, I have lots of, not lots. I have a handful of patients who I'm available to for acute illnesses and we catch them early. We put them on the right supplements. We use some drugs if necessary. And we get all this data where I can monitor them at home to, with a degree of sophistication unheard of before in the history of medicine, particularly because of the new aura ring and what it can do. We need to, uh, we need to, it's, it's aura ring. O U R A ring.com. <laughs> I mean, we, we talk about the aura ring uh, constantly. And I, it's because I'm obsessed with sleep. I've become obsessed with it. Um, it's I, every single day I'm looking at my rating and I will, I will, uh, DM Molly Eastman sometimes and be like, I got a 92 and she's <laughs> like, yay. So, I mean, it's, I, 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 I feel like what you just said is super important. And I think there's, I mean, you mentioned probably 35 different markers to measure. Um, I think Sarah and I are ready to do that and kind of measure all those things. 
But for the everyday biohacker, I think there's something interesting about, you mentioned something in there and I want to pull it out a little bit, is that I'm now doing something because I heard it from a biohacker or I heard it on a podcast. I'm taking a supplement. What is that doing to me? And I think about that constantly because I'm taking a lot of supplements now. I'm taking the mushrooms. I'm doing my 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 uh, berberine and all the and but what what has that? How has that impacted me? And is it the right thing for me? And I think where where you're coming from it sounds like is customizing the solution for people based on those markers. So it really starts with measuring correctly. And then knowing what to do with that measurement. And that's what we're hopefully trying to get done this season is to say, these are the six markers we saw, how we're going to address them. And then what was the impact of those over time? But I'm, I'm, is it, is it completely customized for you, Dr. Stillman? Is that how you approach it with each patient? Well, yes, definitely. But what you'll find is that the more, um, because I, I, you know, particularly when I was building my practice, I I had lots of people from different backgrounds and different levels of resources coming to me to, and yes, it's, it's 100% customized, but what becomes the break on your customization is the amount of time and or money the patients got to invest in their program. And what you'll find as you really get into people's lifestyles is they do need the fundamentals to be the same. That's not customized. There's a certain amount of um, adjustment needs to be made, right? Like I joke with my really pale skinned patients that if they walk outside on a hot summer's day, they're going to burst into flames and they laugh because that's basically their experience. And so you can't tell that person to go out and suntan for an hour. Like you can the olive complexion, Italian, Spanish descent, you know, Mediterranean. Right. And so you, you have to, to customize that, but it's still the same principle. Right. And so I call that prudent sun exposure, which is sun exposure without sun burning, which is, pretty much in a nutshell, how much sun everyone should get in an optimal world, right? Um, but what I found in taking care of lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds is as much as we can gather a tremendous amount of data, we can also do it with a smaller amount of data. We just need them to be willing to put in the time to figure out what we're missing without the extra lab testing. The more, frankly, the more money someone has, and generally speaking, the less time they have because everyone's trying to get their attention. And for them, it's a no brainer to just go ahead and spend the money on lab testing, get the clarity, take the shortcut, but then you'll get tremendous results for people who don't have that kind of money doing simple lab panels that are much more affordable, much more limited, obviously. And then doing things like tracking their diet, looking at their lifestyle, um, adjusting their environment and things like that. And, and I'm so, guessing you're not like looking at people's nutrient deficiencies and just substituting, you know, you're low on B vitamins, so take a B vitamin. I'm guessing that the recommendations are going to be a little bit more generic in that, okay, you need to look at light first. So, you know, you can take all the supplemental B you like, but if you're rust glued to your phone every morning, or if you're, you know, if you're doing a lot of unhealthy behaviors, the B vitamin you know, it's not going to touch the sides. So I'm guessing a lot of these nutrient panels are only useful if people are actually doing the kind of general advice, which to me sounds like you're focused a lot more on light exposure and correct exercise. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because you would be shocked at how hard it is to replete nutrients in people who want sleep. Right. Yeah. They will dump nutrients into the system and they will, they will, they will question reality. They're like, am I taking magnesium? You know, did that happen? How do I trust this nutrient level? And I say, look, give me a person with a normal stress level with a mag level like yours and give them the same magnesium supplementation that you're taking for the same period of time, their level will go up by 10 or 15 points. And you're telling me that you don't understand why yours didn't go up by three or four. But, you know, you're running two companies, you're flying three times a month, you're, you know, ha have three girlfriends and, you know, eight cars, <laughs> you know, you have a lot more stress. And um, the tough thing in some respects becomes a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want me to enable them to continue burning the candle at both ends. And it's, uh, that's tough. Yeah, I'm sure you can look at your panel, see what you're missing and just substitute it. It should be easy. You see what you're missing? Put it in your diet. Jobs are good and you're all done. But of course, you know, we'll... Well, that's the other thing, though, about the diet. 
is that a lot of people don't realize that they're getting potentially huge doses of nutrients from their diet. And so like selenium is one that I, I've seen this happen with. Selenium at 100 to 400 micrograms per day won't create selenium toxicity in most people. But I've seen, I have, have seen one selenium level of 500, which is way out of range um, in the blood. The normal is like 150 to like 180. So 500 is three or almost four times what it should be, right? So that person said, you got to stop your 200 microgram a day selenium supplement because a 200 microgram a day selenium supplement is like an ounce or something of Brazil nuts. And this has happened multiple times now. I've, I've had someone quantify how many Brazil nuts they were eating and they looked and we saw their selenium level and they said, wow, I'm getting a lot of this. I have a high selenium level. Mostly it just gets eliminated by the body. But if, if you take into account these things, you'll figure stuff out that other people will miss. Like we just, I just had a case where the person is complaining on this litany of problems, right? And they're eating zero B12 zero. I don't really need to do a B12 test to know that this person's B12 level is not optimal. Even if they had a normal blood test for B12, I would say, I don't care. I want you to eat some red meat or some shellfish. And can you supplement it? Because I have a lot, I have a lot of family members who are very strict vegetarians and they won't eat anything like that, even though I kind of do bang on about B12. Do you think it's easy to supplement or not? So you can and for some people, and B12 is a really, it's really puzzling to me um, because it's one of the vitamins that we've never established a toxic dose. It's like we've never established toxic doses for melatonin. We've never established toxic doses for B12. Most vitamins and minerals will create some kind of toxidrome if you really overdose. But they've done, I mean, absolutely insane no amounts of B12 injectable. So you know they're absorbing it in people without creating a toxidrome. And what's interesting about it is a thousand micrograms of B12, which is the standard dose, is a really, really high dose compared to what you can get in your diet. And you'll see people with normal B12 metabolism and levels who are getting 10, 20, 30 micrograms a day, which is strange, right? Why would you be able to eat just that little and have normal metabolism? And then you need a thousand micrograms to overcome. And I've seen people need two, three, four milligrams, not necessarily to fix their numbers, but to help their symptom. And that's where megadose vitamin therapy, you know, a la Linus Pauling, Abram Hoffer, the orthomolecular medicine gurus way back in the way back. It's funny to say way back, I'm thinking of a mentor of mine, Brad Weeks, who's like, he's, he trained with Hoffer. He, he knew guys like Emmanuel Ravici and, and Linus Paul and people were in that world, but, you know, they would go to these super high doses of supplements and they would get clinical and therapeutic results. So anyway, yes, you can supplement it. I just, I'm really skeptical of, uh, skeptical. When you look at the data on vitamin supplementation, there's a lot of problems because the people who do vitamin supplementation studies tend to be academics who don't actually practice with vitamins. They kind of, have, they think, oh, well, maybe B6 will help asthma. So they give a bunch of asthmatics B6. And you can look at the study and you'll say, we well, you used a bad form of B6. And there's so many problems with quality control in, in vitamins and supplements that it's important to be mindful of that when you're interpreting the literature. And then there's compliance and there's lifestyle and there's diet factors. But one thing that's really clear to me is that when you look at dietary intakes of nutrients, there's optimal ranges for the dietary intakes from whole foods. And no matter how many supplement trials we do, we don't seem to reduce mortality across the board with high dose supplements. I wouldn't use them if they didn't fix symptoms without adverse events and without adverse effects on mortality. And if they didn't fix numbers that are important, right? So like hemoglobin A1C is a great example. You can drop a lot of hemoglobin A1Cs with a combination ketogenic diets, of course, but also things like high levels of magnesium, supplementation with things like potassium, supplementation with things like thiamine and other B vitamins that help that cascade 
run that are frequently depleted in diabetics. So that's why, you know, across the board, and that's why I'm not really a fan of multivitamins. I mean, when you really break down what your diet consists of, you'll be amazed at the micronutrient density you can achieve just with whole foods and a wide variety and adequate caloric intake. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the way we're going to go, certainly to start with. So what would be what would be your kind of top recommendations for tests that we should do without spending a huge amount of money, but at least get a baseline with the goal of, you know, increasing our longevity, not necessarily our looks, but brain health, functionality. <laughs> I think we could give up on the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sarah, we don't, th- these looks we are, as, this is, gr- we look amazing. This is great. This is, we, we look fine. We, you, you look great. I look fine. I'm happy with the fact that I'm 50 looking like this. Still have some hair. Still so some hair. Um, the labs I mentioned before, and then I met, I forgot one, which is funny because it's one, maybe my favorite one is the high sensitivity CRP. The high sensitivity CRP is used as a prognostic factor for um, for heart disease risk. But what you'll see is it can also go up in pretty much any inflammatory state. So autoimmune illnesses, um, if it's a harbinger of, it could be a harbinger of things like dementia. I don't think it's been really well studied for that, but I wouldn't, I would be surprised if a high sensitivity CRP elevation doesn't correlate with a higher dementia risk. So all the things that people basically fear and come to me to help avoid or mitigate or tree, uh, I look at the high sensitivity CRP as being our number one barometer. And what does that stand for? CRP? And then the vitamin D. Oh, high sensitivity CRP is C-reactive protein. It's an inflammatory marker. It's made in the liver. And the high sensitivity version, the scale is zero to three. You want to be under one. And it's high in its sensitivity, therefore the name, um, in the sense that it will go up with very small problems with your metabolism. And that's also one reason why doctors don't like to run it. They don't like to run it because it creates a lot of questions. Uh, And unfortunately with the current medical model, the doctors don't have the time to do the lifestyle and dietary counseling in order to help people fix their high sensitivity CRPs. So patients get frustrated because basically the interaction is you have a problem I don't have enough time to give you a solution. Go out and diet and exercise. And the patient says, what does that even mean? And they feel sort of defeated and frustrated and angry. Um, and that's just, it's, it's one reason why prevention has gotten so, so focused on things that are just discrete, concrete, obvious, like vaccines, colon cancer screening, all these things make the hospital system money anyway. Um, and that's what, what, I mean, that's why my practice is different. We don't look at prevention from a you know, perspective of, you know, what can we bill for? It's a matter of how can we optimize everything so that people are not calling us for or, or winding up on the operating table. I mean, I'd be, I'd be very upset if any of my patients who I take very close care of ended up with a real acute medical problem because I would feel like I failed. Uh, and because we spent so much time, effort, let alone money, dialing in all these numbers and taking all these supplements and getting the doses right and, and whatnot. So. Okay, so we have all of those tests. We're looking at baseline heart rate variability. And not just heart rate variability, but all the other ordering metrics are important too. Respiratory rate is vastly underappreciated as a marker for health. I mean, one of the things that you know Jim and I will look at first is the respiratory rate. Somebody with a respiratory rate in the above 14, they need to get that down with something like buteco breathing. And a lot of them won't get results until they do that. They'll chase symptoms with supplements and biohacks and diet and light and whatever. And I just tell people, look, if you're going to blow off the breath work, just don't even bother. Please don't be my patient. It's going to be too hard. I'm going to get upset. I'm going to get <laughs> frustrated. Okay. So let's just not, let's not, let's not go down that road. Yeah. Breathing is, 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 is an interesting one. I, I, I tend to be a mouth breather at night and I need to do a lot of, I, I think we have to change the name of this, but the hostage tape, um, I do need to do that. And I don't know why they, like, it's a terrible name. We have to call it something different. Is there another name for it? The like, mouth tape? I don't know what to call it. Just mouth it's called call hostage it? tape. If that you look, is there's... not, Russ. It's not called hostage <laughs> tape. <laughs> I swear to you. I don't know anything about hostage tape, but when I heard about mouth taping, I just said, oh, what did I use to, because when you're, when someone's on a mechanical ventilator, they have a tube going down their throat. 
but you need the tube to stay in a very clear position. Otherwise they go down into the lungs, not good, or come up into the throat and that's not good either. So you need to fix it somewhere. And we do that with tape. We do it with tape and with a little mouth clamp thing, device that I don't even know the name of. But that tape is basically hypoallergenic, easy off, easy on, doesn't damage the skin. So I just went out and bought that. Okay. I don't know what your supplier <laughs> is, Ross. You're going to the wrong shop. <laughs> <laughs> I would, it, yeah. This is the thing about mouth that kind of cracks me up is that, you know, I see all these people marketing it as mouth tape and I'm like, this is like $4 on Amazon. If you know what to look for based on you know, like what we're using in healthcare, I, I, you could convince me that there's benefits to using organic, non-GMO, cruelty-free, vegan, fair trade, you know, low chemical mouth tape. Great but I don't know if it's actually making anything that sophisticated for mouth tape. I, I just sent you both the, the link to, it's a company and they're, they're marketing it, uh, the mouth tape for, for breathing, thing, getting, you know, nose breathing, uh, nasal breathing. <laughs> they're, they're called hostage. It's called hostage tape, which again, poor choice of name, but gets the point across, I guess. To me, the, the thing about mouth taping right at night is that a lot of people want to jump to that. But you got to think about the other 16 hours of your day. I mean, show me somebody who's under excessive stress. I'll show you someone who's headed for dysfunctional breathing mechanics. They have to put in the work to fix the breathing mechanics. And the, 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 the work of being well is daily work. It's not something that you can, I mean, you just cannot expect to neglect the fundamentals and still get the results. It's like saying, I'm going to skip going to the gym for four weeks and then take a bunch of supplements or use a bunch of drugs to maintain my muscle mass. Can you do that? Yeah. Does it make you healthy? No. And the breathing thing is an interesting one. Yeah. I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too far off topic here. We're already at 50 minutes, but the breathing thing is like, you know, one doctor said, Oh, you need, you have a deviated septum. You need surgery. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go through that surgery. I don't want any more surgery on my face. Like I've had enough. So there are probably ways to deal with the fact that I don't have cl clear. They clear are, passages but it's hard work. Too, I right? have a face former, which is like a plastic thing that you put in your mouth, and then you bite down and you do these exercises. Uh, it's a company from Germany that I'm kind of testing it, but it's hard work, and it makes your face ache, and you have to set aside ten minutes every day on top of all your other hacks that you're doing, and like standing with your head back and. Have you heard of mewling where you have to stand against the wall and you have to do these, you know, it's, that's what. I've never heard mew, of that. It's called mew, mew, mewing and you have to kind of make certain <laughs> noises. But this is what I mean. This is what I think we want to find out. Mewing, it's a, do, it's a doctor here in the UK and he's developed like a technique for um, different face positions because the whole structure of our faces, you know, in, Western society, our faces have collapsed a little bit, you know, the generations. And so trying to expand your airways so that you can breathe, even if you've got a deviated septum, you know, that you have to go back there. And how do you expand your airways? But this is what I think we want to find out with rebel scientists, because there are a hundred things you could do and you would never get any work done. With all the gadgets and things I've got just laying around this room, I could do the whole day and not actually do anything else so what we want to do is try and first of all prioritize which things go in which order because like you say it's no use mouth taping if you can't even breathe during the day and then well that's where the thing i focus on is the respiratory rate. right the respiratory yeah because if you do buteco breathing well you're going to increase your tolerance to carbon dioxide and you're going to decrease your respiratory rate and that's the number one thing you need to do and that obviates the need to change your airway structure. If you're breathing less through a narrower airway, you're not going to have the same problems as if you're trying to move a bunch of air through a narrow airway. So it's, 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 uh, I mean, I'm all about simplicity in what I do. I'm writing a blog post today and the, and the quote I put in was, um, it was from Einstein or no, it was from Isaac Newton. And it says something like, um, the truth is ever found in simplicity, not in the multiplication of things. And that's what I try and do with my practice because I'm working with people who need me to make it simple and, and get them to focus on the fundamentals because they don't have a lot of time. Yeah. 
That's super cool. And I think that's where we're at. We're going to try and do it by our own experimentation and see how we can kind of get a priority of things that you can do in a certain order that would kind of set the ground for maybe some of these little bit more advanced hacks that will give you the edge. But let's get the, let's get the baseline set to start with. And so that's really what we did in our previous season. We did sleep. We did breathe. We did eat. And Dr. Silman, it would be great to have you back on to when we once we get our numbers and we start our, down our path and to talk to you a little bit about what we found out and if we're on the right path, are we missing anything? It'd be great to have you back on kind of like a, like a mid session check in or something uh, just to see how we're doing. And we're, we're, we're hopeful this season will be one that's um, really going to address very, very specific things. So we're very excited and r incredibly uh, informative uh, episode. Thank you so much for, for all the information. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Stillman. Pleasure yeah. being here. Me. Yes, it's brilliant. So we'll get all of those tests and we'll 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 get on the road to kind of that self assessment. So thank you, yeah. Lots of notes made. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care. Breaking the crack.